Welcome to the Long Reef self-guided field trip location. The reason for this site is to show you some of the different types of rocks around the Sydney region, including those that aren't Hawkesbury Sandstone for a change, as well as some of the major structural uh, defects and formations that we've heard of. First of all with safety. Where we are here is right on the coast. We have a large rock platform and so we have large waves breaking on the edge of the platform. The first thing to note is that you should never approach the edge of the platform no matter how still the sea uh, appears to be. There is no reason to approach the edge of the platform so keep well away. So the second thing is that the platform is very slippery being predominantly uh, clay based rocks. So please wear sturdy footwear and walk very slowly if you're going out onto parts of that rock platform. Additionally, we're very exposed. So we're out in the sunshine, we're out in the wind. So please make sure you wear sunscreen, sunglasses, a hat, um, bring lots of water, etc., to keep yourself hydrated. All right, now let's look around the site. All right, so we've looked at the geology map and so we've come here with an idea of what we might be seeing. So now we can look around the site and identify some of those rock units. The oldest unit, or the deepest unit, is the Bolgo sandstone. So this is a, a sandstone with shale interbeds within that unit. This outcrops to the east of the site, right on the tip of the site. Above the Bolgo sandstone is the Bald Hill claystone. And the Bald Hill claystone makes up most of our site. So all the rock platform and most of the cliffs are in that material. The Bald, uh, the Bald Hill claystone is a predominantly a shale and claystone unit, but it also has various fine and medium grain sandstone units in it. So it's a bit of a mixture of materials. The background to the Bald Hill claystone is that it originated as volcanics and those volcanics then weathered, eroded, went into rivers and were deposited in a delta. And then that built up, lithified and became the Bald Hill Claystone. So the volcanic origin gives the Bald Hill Claystone that reddish look. So if you're looking around the site, you see the red rock, that's the Bald Hill Claystone. Above the Bald Hill Claystone, we find the Newport Formation. Now this is a interbedded sandstones and shales, and we identify that unit only in the really high points of the site. So to the north, there's a small amount outcropping and at the top of the, the cliff face. We also find the Newport Formation further to the west in the hills, the lower half of the hills. Above the Newport Formation is our Hawkesbury Sandstone that we've seen at some of the other sites. So the Hawkesbury Sandstone's right on top of the hills in the far background. Also in any of the rock, platform, uh, the rock headlands to the south, that's all Hawkesbury Sandstone. You can see that by looking at the cliff faces. They're very steep, there's no rock platform. So they're just forming very steep vertical faces as the rock's very strong, resistant to erosion. At this site, the platform's really big and wide and flat, and that's because it's claystone and can erode more rapidly, and so we end up with a smooth platform. Further to the north, we have predominantly the Newport Formation and the Bald Hill Claystones, and again, much shorter pl rock platforms, although there, they're a bit stepped, the cliffs, because you've got claystones and shales, as well as sandstones. So sandstones forming the steep cliffs, shales, claystones forming the flatter slopes. As far as soils are concerned, if we look to the west, we can see the golf course. The first thing to note with the golf course is the slope, so it's dipping away from us. Now as always, think of the large model for Sydney, that is a basin. The middle of the basin, west of the Harbour Bridge. So it's somewhere to the west and slightly to the south of us. So all the layering should be dipping towards that location. So at this site, if we're part of the regional model and there's no local deformation, I'd be expecting all the layers to dip to the, roughly to the west. And if we look at 
if we look at the slope angle on the golf course, it's dipping to the west. So this might be a dip slope, i.e. a slope angle controlled by the bedding plane. We should look at some of the other exposures around the site to confirm that, but that would be our first guess. Further to the south, so the south, as to the, further to the west, we can see the golf course is in sands. Down at the northern part of the beach down here, we also can locate peats and clays. So this is an area of interest to us. About 6,000 years ago, the sea level had finished rising. And this site was actually an island. So the headland that we're standing on at the moment was sticking up above the sea. And then there was water behind us and then the mainland. Since then, the waves have been coming around the island and crashing in behind us. And that's been bringing sand in behind the island. And there's been no way for that sand to escape. So there's been sand building up behind the island that we're, we're standing on. So that now the sand is above the sea level. So now we're sitting on a tombolo, an island to, connected to the mainland by sand. Other things we see over there, the peat, the clays, indicate swampy environments. And if we look just to the south and the west, we can see DY Lagoon. So best guess is that the lagoons used to actually go in behind where we are. So the golf, co golf course is on old lagoon materials, peats and clays, as well as marine sands, as well as right at the bottom, probably some alluvial sands, river-based sands, because it was probably rivers that cut the original valley behind this headland. We're now down on the northern rock platform of Long Reef and we're having a look at the rock face behind me. So always remember, as I always say, look as big as you can, work into the detail. So we'll start and look as big as we can. If we look at the rock face, we have two units. So if you remember, most of the, the site is Bald Hill Claystone. And what we're standing on is Bald Hill Claystone, as is most of those maroon, reddish coloured layers that we can see behind me. Right at the top, the more wider, lighter coloured layer or unit, that's the Newport formation that we mentioned earlier. The next step that we do is we look at each of those units. And the first thing being in sedimentary rock that we look for is the bedding planes or, and the, bed, uh, the beds and bedding planes. So looking back, we can follow those bedding planes right across the face. One of the things we can notice is that the surface at the top does follow the bedding plane. So we were correct before in that we have a dip slope, ground surface matches the bedding uh, plane orientation. So we identify the beds. What we can see in the beds behind me is that they aren't continuous. They'll run along and then they step and they might step again. So what we have there is a series of faults um, that are shifting the beds or shearing those beds. And so we identify those here, we can go up closer and measure those later on. Another thing we can see in the middle of the slope is that we lose all the beds and we've got all this jumbled up material. So right in the middle there, we've got a landslide, material has come down from above and mixed up our units. So that would be colluvium or landslide material. Just over here, at the start of the uh, face, of the cliff face, what we can see is that the beds are going up, then they suddenly disappear, then they're going back down again. And there's a hummocky sort of gully just there. Well, that zone there is a fault zone. So all the material is sheared again over a larger zone and broken all the material up. And that's why it's easily eroded and that's why we have a gully and a track running through that spot. So what we can do here is we identify our major features and we can go and measure those. We can also look for any hints as to stability issues. So we might look up at the face and see if we can see any mechanisms for failure. So if we can see 
two joints maybe forming a block and it slid out, we know that there might be wedge sl sliding problems. We've already identified that there's a landsliding issue in the middle. So we might identify stability issues, identify what the defects are controlling those, we'll go measure those as well. So this is all about stand back, identify the key features, go measure those, don't waste your time measuring things that don't matter. Once we've selected our defects, then it's time to move in and start to do our measurements. Remember, first of all, we've looked up, we've identified there's nothing loose there that can come down on us. Now we can move in and look at things. So if we choose one of our defects, we line our hand up in line with that defect so that we can identify the defect plane. Remember, it's not just a line, it's a plane. So we can see the plane is dipping this way, dipping out towards the water here. The next thing to do is look at any structure, like bedding planes, that cross the plane. So we're looking at bedding planes, trying to follow the bedding plane across the structure. If the bedding plane continues across without any dislocation, any shearing, then we would identify this feature as a, a joint. If, however, we're following the bedding plane along, or any other feature, it hits the defect plane and then we identify that it's moved down, so it's sheared, then this would be a fault. So if we look at this one, we move in a little bit, let's have a look. We have this darker purple bed coming along. It disappears. So if we look down here, the purple blue interface, purple blue interface here, along, it's stepped down and it's come back here. So that means that here we have a fault. Now when we have a fault, we've got a few other definitions to put in. So we've got above the fault, so the block above the fault plane, we'd call the hanging block. And the block below the fault plane, we'd call the foot wall block, or the foot block. If the upper block has slid down the plane, then what we have is a normal fault. So this block's slid down. I'm thinking it's a normal fault because it's come down here. Had it gone the other way and this had moved up, we'd have a reverse fault. What we're standing on right here is actually a, a small anticline. So if we look over on this side and we look at the beds of rock, they're orientated roughly that direction. Yeah, if we look on this side of me, the beds are orientated that way. So we're in a, a fold, an anticline. It's going like this, and we've just eroded down through the top of that anticline. What you can see behind me is a fold. So previously we saw sub horizontally bedded layers. Now what we can see is one bed coming down and then it's turning and going back up again. So where we have that type of structure, we have a syncline. Had it gone the other way and formed sort of an A, we'd have an anticline. Also thinking in 3D, when you come out here, as long as the tide's out, you should be able to see the extra or close, more closely spaced jointing within the rock platform along the axis of the fold. So this would be important if we were thinking about tunnelling or something like that. If we're tunnelling across the axis of a fold, it's going to be more jointed up, more broken up rock, so we'd probably have to put more support in. Another thing to notice is about halfway up, you're getting the seepage coming out of the slope. So this is from the water groundwater infiltrating into the ground, hitting the low permeability claystone and running along the higher permeability sandstone layers. So it's another important thing to note when we're trying to come up with a hydrogeological model, understanding what the groundwater is doing for our design. All right, we're at the dike now. Um, the first thing to point out is that we are here at low tide, but the swell is really big. 
So if the swell's this big when you're out here, do not do what we're doing. Um, but unfortunately, we only get one go at this, so we're going ahead with it. Um, let's continue. What you can see is a bit of the dike running this way and a bit of the dike going up, and it continues right across the platform as shown in the geology map. If you look at, if we, if you come out here and look at the detail, we can just, we can see the crystals if we're looking carefully. That means it's coarser than basalt and it's actually a dolerite, this, this um, intrusion. The middle of the dike tends to have a larger crystals and as you go to the outside, they're finer crystals. That's because the center has cooled down slower and so it's had more time for the crystals to grow. Also, if you look at the margins of the dike as well as the claystone around it, you'll see that it should be a bit more jointed in those locations. And that's again because of the rapid cooling. One of the things you should take out of this is the fact that the dike is not continuous. When we look on the geology map, the dike is always shown as a straight line and a continuous straight line. But if we think about how it's actually formed, and that is that magma under pressure has been forcing its way to the surface following any weakness zone, then we might expect that it may not be a straight line. In this case, the weakness zones are the joints in the Bald Hill Claystone. And so if the joints are discontinuous, the liquid, the magma, will follow those joints and the cooled down dike will also be discontinuous. So we can see here, it comes along, terminates, starts again over here, continues along, terminates a bit further down, continues somewhere else. So just remember that it's, if you've got a dike at one point, a dike at another point, it may not be exactly a straight line or a straight wall of igneous material. To the east of us now, there is a small anticline, impossible to see with the water over the platform, and then further over, we'll go and have a look at the, the rock unit over there. Okay, where we are now is out on the eastern point of Long Reef, and this is where we see the Bolgo sandstone exposed. Now, if you remember the geology map, the Bolgo sandstone is a sandstone unit with some shale interbeds. There's probably a bit more shale interbeds here than we might expect from that de description. So if we look behind me, we've got the harder sandstones, and then interbedded with that is the shales. Remember the shales are fissile, they have planes of weakness in them. So we can see that clearly in, in that behind me and just below me with the shale sandstone and the shale beneath that. If we look at the, the beds, you might observe they're actually dipping to the east. A bit strange because all the other beds that we've been looking at dipping to the west. So you may remember that I just mentioned the fold or the anticline between the dike and here. So what's happened is that out here things are dipping this way. Most the regional dip is that way. And so we've got a fold just to the west of this outcrop. So the rock's going up and back down and this rock is diving below the Bald Hill Claystone which is the, old, is the younger rock compared to this. And then all the units are tilted this way. Thanks for joining me at a slightly windy and moist long reef. If you get the opportunity to and you've got the time, try and do the long reef excursion. It's probably my favourite. Um, so do it, enjoy it, and then join me in the traffic on the way back to campus.